a technical issue that we're seeing more and more frequently over the last several years is facilities that have mysteriously changing yields throughout the year, despite other things seemingly not changing. So yields going up and quality improving during winter and early spring. And then in late spring and summer and early fall, having the yields go down, having more plant problems, and just this repeating yearly pattern. It turns out what's been going on is a lot of water tables have been increasing in temperature. And that means the source water that facilities are using changes throughout the time of the year. And the temperature can be really warm and it'll drop the DO levels and increase the risk of pathogens. So a lot of facilities, especially this is greenhouse and outdoor see this, but also indoor, are seeing issues where at certain times of year, the low DO and increased pathogen pressure is reducing the yields. And you can come in and fix this really easily and, and measure it. You can look and see, oh, okay, your source water is coming in way too warm and the DO levels bottomed out in here. And sometimes there's different options, depends on how the water is being stored. If there's source water storage, like in an RO tank, in a climate controlled room, but a lot of the time it involves running chillers and things like that. And if you can get that water down into a more optimal temperature range, then you're going to prevent a huge amount of those problems. And you see the annual yields stabilize and the quality stabilize year round. Uh, and touching off of what Tyler's saying with DO, uh, referring to dissolved oxygen, is a measure typically in PPM or percentage of the amount of oxygen in the water. And what that's going to relate to is the health of the root zone. As the leaves take up CO2 for their breathing mechanism, much like people breathe oxygen, the roots do the opposite. They do what people do, which is they respirate and require from metabolism oxygen. And then they want oxygen to be at specific levels to operate optimally, just like we, we've we evolved to have a certain amount of oxygen in our atmosphere. It's almost an inverse relationship as temperatures going up the amount of dissolved oxygen that the water can hold on to is going to go down. And then the opposite, as the temp water temperature goes down and you enrich somehow with dissolved oxygen, the ability for that water is, is going to be higher to hold on to it. But you have other issues that come as the water gets too cold and too cold and relating to the performance of the crop. From an ag recommendation, a lot of really high quality source water, say it's well water that's not stagnated, is typically going to be in the high single digits, maybe six, eight ppm. If you're super, super lucky in the low, low teens would be phenomenal source water quality for a starting amount of dissolved oxygen. But you take that same water and you say raise the water temperature to 90 degrees and you're going to go from maybe 10 ppm to possibly not even being able to measure the level of dissolved oxygen in the water at that point, or being several factors lower than you started with. Optimally too, uh, when you're discussing, okay, what does the plant really desire? It's typically somewhere in that 15 to 20 PPM is from a, an ag or horticulture perspective. The vast majority of crops perform optimally if you can maintain the DO around, you know, 15, 20 ppm. Something that's unique to dissolved oxygen too is that it is corrosive and it has oxidation potential and quite a bit actually. So you can run DO also at too high of levels and begin to hurt the root zone is something that's really important to consider. A temperature meter can go a long ways just towards giving you an idea if there might be a DO problem, but depending on what your budget is for sensors. Uh, kind of the gold standard is the Pro Solo o optical DO meter. So that's, that'd be like the, if you're going to Google search for it, that'd be a Pro Solo ODO meter. They're kind of expensive. I think about 1200 bucks. If you can get one and use it between several different facilities as necessary to take temperature and DO readings a couple of times a year, that can be really useful. Yeah. Like a lot of things being optimal. Um, Something to touch on is deltas or changing things over time. I think um, as a company and as growers, we talk about cues and something Tyler has been huge on and using that word and really incorporating our, our vocabulary of cues. So we do know, okay, you get towards the end of flower and you want to bring out a certain amount of expression and color or, you know, have the trichome and the actual oil and glandularness expressed differently you could lower the temperature of the water and absolutely provide the plant a cue. 
but through and through general recommendations would be running your water temperature somewhere around 66 degrees to 68 degrees and that's where from a coolness or the lack of heat of the water you're not going to damage the root zone but you're also going to be able to pump in and maintain a large amount of dissolved oxygen in the water and keep it in the water for long periods because that's an important consideration is not only as you go up in temperature can the water hold on to less dissolved oxygen initially but also once you've added oxygen to hot water it's going to dissipate or go away very quickly from the initial amount that you added that's kind of where that 66 to 68 degree comes in both from marrying together plant performance and health but other attributes of water whether it's even ph or, or specifically what we're talking about dissolved oxygen yeah i think that's a great point and like you're saying on the other end of it there's also risks of the root zone getting too cold and specific issue I've seen in a few greenhouses once I've consulted for here in Northern California is the root zone temperatures getting so cool at certain times of the year that the overall metabolic rate of the plant is bottlenecked by root zone temperatures. And so you could be providing the perfect climate, the perfect amount of nutrients and lighting and seeing really, really slow growth rates and poor plant structure. And that can come entirely down to root zone temperatures. So that's another sort of tricky problem to solve, which can be analogous, but a little different than the water temperature issue because the root zone temperatures are going to be operating on the plant regardless of when irrigation is happening. It's gonna be operating all night long as well and in between shots. So in some scenarios, the most efficient thing you can do is put in some sort of hydronic heating system that brings up the root zone temperature to a certain minimum. And if that's the bottleneck, then you can see really, really impressive gains in yield just from doing that. Huge, especially early in the industry. The best, the best example I give is when we put pots on the ground. It didn't matter if you fed it 68 degrees, 72 or 90 degrees. If that concrete was 50 degrees, you were going to have a tremendously low root zone temperature. And in Denver in the wintertime, you know, back in the day, that's exactly what would happen and we'd be chasing our tails. The other one is root zone temperature that we found pretty quickly was relative humidity. And we talk about a lot about VPD, meaning maintaining very healthy humidity and very high humidity. In very dry environments, your root zone temperature and the air surrounding your rhizosphere, the soil, or things containing water can change very, very quickly. By having moisture in the air at the proper le level, it also actually provides a buffer to the root zone as well. And these are grows that were very much legacy grows in 2010, 2009 to 11, and uh, started on the ground and eventually went on tables. And we used to, I mean, we'd walk in the room, we'd know, okay, the water was 72 degrees, and then we would take an infrared gun. And this sometimes would only take 30 minutes of a plant resting on a concrete ground we'd shoot it with an infrared gun, knowing the water went in at 72 and could walk back to the tanks and check the temperature again. And the root zones would be in the low 60s or high 50s within 30 minutes of sitting on concrete floors. That for data for us proved it very, very quickly. We tracked the time between feeding, the water temperature going in, and then the infrared readings from the guns, and it became very obvious. Another item to touch on that I really enjoyed earlier in some conversation I had with Tyler specifically even today was uh, we discussed changes in pH and it really made me think about consistency in water temperature, which is what we're talking about right now is people do have chillers, they have the ability that even room specific to change water temperature from day to day or week to week. And there can be a lot of value in just having consistency. Um, when you know, okay, at this temperature, I have this level of dissolved oxygen and it stays that way, it can provide you a really strong baseline to gauge your performance off of and to, to build a foundation off of. Yeah, I love that. And I think the, the overall point that I want to hammer in is that consistency is often underrated right now because people are very concerned with doing really fine tuning and customization of different parameters week by week throughout the facility's harvest schedule. And that can sometimes cause more problems than it solves. And one of the things that I see uh, a, a number of tech issues with is people trying to make small pH adjustments to counteract what they see as negative changes happening in the runoff or the root zone or something like that. You'll see some sort of complicated 
pH adjustment schedules. Like we're going to start off feeding at 5.7. And then as the cultivation cycle progresses, we're going to raise up our pH and feed at 6.2 later on closer to flower. Um, you know, we're going to manipulate which micronutrients and macronutrients become available to the plant, or we're going to be looking at runoff and we see it dropping a tiny bit. So we're going to increase the feed pH to compensate. And I think this usually just causes more problems than it solves. Um, and one of the big reasons is that with the way nutrients are created, look at you look at front row egg nutrients and we've got really nice advanced chelation agents and things like that that make the nutrients the micronutrients bioavailable highly bioavailable at a wide variety of phs so these little minute adjustments of like oh we're going to start at 5.8 and end at 6.0 or 6.1 are really having no effect whatsoever because the nutrients are highly bioavailable in that entire range and what you're doing is introducing a whole bunch of opportunities for things to actually go wrong and ultimately decreasing your yield. And if you are trying to counteract some perceived pH drop in the runoff or hit some pH target in your nutrient solution to try to enhance or reduce bioavailability of certain nutrients and you, for example, accidentally push your pH too high and it drifts up to 6.3 at a higher EC, well, you're instantly kicking off a cascade of precipitation between calcium and phosphorus in the nutrient solution because the combination of high pH plus time and high EC is just going to cause those things to react with each other. And you're going to end up with a bunch of calcium phosphate clogging up filters and things like that. So, yeah, I think that a lot of facilities could really just benefit by saying, we are going to just peg our feed pH 5.9 from start to finish. We're going to get really good bioavailability of all the nutrients. If we start to see something change in our runoff, we can manipulate the runoff volume um, so that we're getting greater replenishment and drainage to try to keep the pH in range there. And that's going to be a much more consistent and safer solution for the long run. I agree. Something interesting I feel that we see is uh, throughout the evolution of time is in one grower or cross grows is that growers get more experienced and as they get more experienced, they have more time to focus on things that they hadn't focused on before. And the other commonality generally is that the buildings get improved. They get better systems, better tracking, uh, monitoring systems, whether it's uh, substrate sensors, ability to track runoff. And the question I always ask people is, well, when did you start tracking that data and what was it before you started tracking and the reason i ask that is most often they don't know and so then they'll tell you well i'm getting a 5.5 ph in my runoff and it's like well when your crops were awesome and you're growing the best chronic you've ever grown did you know whether it was a 5.5 a 4.4 or a 7.8 you didn't know and so why now because you can see the value are you going to start jumping through hoops to change things that actually could to take take away from what you're doing? Yeah, yeah, really great point. I think it's something that people mess up on and start causing themselves problems by overthinking it on this exact thing on a really regular basis, especially with seeing low pH in the runoff. It's important to track runoff, and I think it's really valuable to track volume and pH and EC of the runoff because you can get good information there. But you can also overread into that and make too big of changes based on the information. And sometimes people forget to just like look at the plants and say, are they charging? Well, maybe having your runoff drop down into the 5.4 range is not a problem in the slightest. Um, and like Matt was saying, you know, before you were ever measuring runoff pH and you were crushing it, maybe that's exactly where it was. And then trying to manage something at that point can just cause you to run into some real issues over time. I saw this in another way recently as well. And sometimes your runoff can be misleading. And there was a facility that was, um, they were seeing certain runoff results and it wasn't really matching up with what their substrate sensors were showing and they were getting a little bit confused and then they were trying to manage 
what was happening by adjusting the pH of their feed solution. And it turns out you look at the irrigation schedule and we pull it up and the P1 irrigations are, they're so steep that they're not even differentiated. You can't even see the individual irrigations. It's just like a single line straight up. And so I get this sense. I'm like, okay, I think I know what's happening here. And I was like, let's look at the schedule a little bit. And it turns out that they're doing for their P1 irrigations, they're doing a 10% shot size, which is a pretty sizable shot. And those shots are repeating every 15 minutes. And in this scenario, a 10% shot takes four minutes. So that means that they were doing a, a four minute shot, having an 11 minute rest time. That's the rest of the 15 minutes. And then the next P1 shot would start. And the problem is when you're having these really short rest times between shots of like 11 minutes, then you are not giving enough time for, for that shot to horizontally wick into the substrate. You want it to come out in a nice cone and fully saturate, replenish all of the substrate before you start causing drainage. So what was happening is they're doing these really short rest times, which are causing more of a column of water to form straight down through the cocoa. This will happen in Rock Bowl too. And then you get false drain, which is runoff before it's fully captured all of the nutrients and replenish them. So you're getting runoff that looks a lot different than what the plants are actually experiencing. And if you try to make decisions based on that, like, oh, now we're going to start tweaking our feed pH and things like that then things can run off the rails pretty quickly. So it's important to make sure that the data you're using is actually representative of what's going on in a meaningful way.